network a few years ago. So our goal has been to educate and empower our community. And I hope today that you digest all of this uh, wonderful information because it's going to uplift not only yourself, but your family. So have a great day. Thank you. Thank you, Natasha. All right. Um, we're going to ease into this today. I would like to bring up John Spellman, our real estate agent. He is one of our panelists today. Let's give him a round of applause. And then I would also like to bring in Farida Stokes. She is a real estate broker, and she's going to be another one of our panelists today. Next, I want to call up Jossie Edwards. She is our financial advisor and investor for today. She has so many different hats. We just want to call her. We're going to take some Jossie. All right, and last but not least, we're going to bring up Brittany Littlejohn, who is a homeowner and investor as well, and another one of our panelists. So before I introduce each of these panelists, I would like to walk into this with everyone knowing that this is not going to be a typical lecture series on a Saturday morning. Um, we want this to serve as a conversation. Um, most importantly, I would like to open up with that. I am not a homeowner. I'm a renter. So that's the best part about me being the moderator for today, is that not only am I going to learn from them, we are all going to learn from them collectively. And so today is going to be a really good conversation, pretty much. Let's look at it that way. Um, these is, this is not going to bore us. We're going to laugh, we're going to talk. And we want you guys to be as authentic and open as possible. So I'm going to pass the mic over to let each of you introduce yourselves individually to our audience today. So we're going to start here with Rick. Uh, my name is Brittany Littlejohn. Uh, my name is Brittany Littlejohn. Um, I'm from Trenton, of course. I grew up in the North War area uh, where all my, that's where all everything, I grew up in the North War area and um, I decided to give back to my community. So I bought property just in that one area because that's where I'm from. That's where all my trauma, everything happened in that one area. So as I'm growing up and as I learned and I grew up more, I understand uh, society more. I woke up and, um, like I said, all my properties that I buy is from that one area to build back my personal community. So I start just with that one area because I can't really take care of the whole Trenton. If I could, I would, but I can't. So I'm real, like, strict on, like, me just going back to my, my, uh, my childhood and re reprogramming it and giving back to that one area to where as though I, um, uh, I, uh, my bad, it's my first time talking, so I'm a little nervous, but we good, we good. So yeah, um, so yeah, so anyway, I, I got properties. I got own a tire shop as well in that area called Lion's Storm and Tires. My dad had it for 25 years. He finally about to give it over to me. And I also started my own company called Worlds to Go, which is a mobile tire shop in that area. You will see us around. We reprogramming that as well for the Mercer County. And um, that's pretty much what I do. Hi again, uh, Jossie. <laughs> um, like Tyler said, I wear many hats. Um, I am a homeowner. I am a real estate investor. I own four houses in the city of Trenton. Uh, similar to Brittany, I grew up. I grew up in Trenton. I was born and raised here, all around the city. I'm not really particular to any area, but you ask me. I'm from Wilkes section, <laughs> but um, but I my goal as someone that was formerly homeless is to buy properties and fix them up and make them affordable. Um, I do work with Section Eight. I do work with people with low income, and I stay under market with my rentals. Uh, I also am a councilwoman here in the city at large, and um, a lot of the things that I do legislatively is geared around economic development, things like home ownership, business development, small businesses, entrepreneurship, and things like that. And um, my, my biggest charge is to reduce gun violence, and all of this is relative to the work that I do um, as a legislator. But outside of that, as in terms of real estate, uh, education, teaching people, how to buy homes so that we can teach people how to generate wealth that you can pass down to your family, not being priced out of your community. 
um, reaching stability is number one. Stability. I wasn't always stable in my life, and that's where my passion for real estate and home ownership comes from. Um, living in a shelter and seeing so many other hundreds of other women with babies that were homeless was heart wrenching, and it drove me to do what you see here today. So I hope you enjoy. It. My name is John Spellman. Born in Brooklyn, raised in Trenton. Well, moved to Trenton in 2002. Um, recently got my license back in 2021, 2020. Um, my goal is to help um, new homeowners achieve their goal of home ownership um, because my family, they sold their home and we felt like we lost our wealth. So if I can bring wealth to young people or people of our demographic, um, that, that's my goal in life. Good morning, my name is Farida Stokes, born and raised in the city of Trenton. Um, I claim real possession in West Trenton. <laughs> um, I, I feel like an OG up here. I've been in the industry for going on 24 years, and I got into the industry um, after my husband and I bought our home and realizing that there were not many people in our age range who were purchasing properties, and, and we just kind of went through the process. But um, something was spoken to me to get my real estate license, and I've been doing it ever since, and educating people ever since. My, my passion is really helping people um, figure out how not to eat the elephant at one time, but strategize on what they want to do when it comes to real estate, and how to break that down so it's actual attainable things that you can do and, um, and walk through the process. I think so many times people get fearful because they don't know the process, and it seems overwhelming, but if I can, if my and my team can help you step by step with figuring out how to get from point A to point B and help you achieve your goals, then that's what we're here for. So thank you. Thank you to each of you for your introductions. Um, it's really nice to actually hear this because not only do I hear um, that you guys have stable careers in this industry, but it's really nice to hear that you have passion backed up behind what you do. Um, and so one of the first things that I actually would like to learn about each of you is what sparked your interest in home ownership? I heard a little bit of it in some of your stories and your introductions. However, um, the biggest thing is a lot of us are afraid of feeling. So what sparked with me um, when my father sold our family home um, and he sold it for our say $300,000 less than what it was worth. Um, that's the kind of wealth that was lost to our family. And it motivated me to say, hey, okay, that's what my father did, but when my children grow up, um, they're gonna have something. They're gonna have something of their own to pass down to their children. If they decide that they wanna go to college, hey, you have a house, you can sell it, use that, as opposed to getting into student loan debt. So that's kind of my motivation. Um, for me, my uh, grandparents um, own their home. My grandfather's still there in the 200 block of Walnut. And my parents own their home. We grew up on Ellsworth Avenue um, in West Trenton. And when I was in college, um, my parents kept the home that they were in, but they also moved to another home. So that was my first introduction to investment properties, buying something that we consider to be our, our first home and then understanding how we could take the equity from that home, buy up into something different, and still hold on to what we had, and give somebody a start when it comes to renting um, and earning income off of that. So, um, as I mentioned, my husband and I purchased our, our home. We moved from Brooklyn back here to, um, to Mercer County. And um, again, at that time, there were not a lot of black women, black people selling real estate. And so amongst my peers, I was always about educating people. And so um, being able to educate people on the process kind of helped catapult, catapult the business. But now we're looking at real estate, not just, we're looking at real estate as a cornerstone for generational wealth. We're looking at ways of building teams so that we are not only attaining real estate, but also how are we protecting our assets 
and being able to build generational wealth so we're passing those assets down to our children so again i'm passionate we always talk in our communities about how we just don't know and there's so many things so many of us do know and you know so it's important to be a blessing and pass that information on and not only for the information to be passed on but for people to take the information and actually do something with it so it's time to start breaking out of some of those fears and however we can help to do that we do Uh, what sparked for me is uh, growing up, uh, my mom and I fell victim to, uh, in Trenton, they had blue doors. So if you had a blue door, it was city side. They never fixed nothing. Growing up, it leaks. You just, you just living at the worst of the worst, like the, the, the bottom of the bottom. So growing up in the area, um, I didn't like it. And then I went to prison. When I came home, I told myself, like I said, I'm going to invest more into where I'm from. And I kind of, that kind of sparked for me. I didn't like prison either because I don't like to be told what to do. I tried to get a job. I still don't like to be told what to do. That didn't work out for me. So that kind of sparked me to, to give back and be my own boss and do what I wanted to do. And, and, and kind of that gave me a spark of growing up how I, you know, I come from a single mother, but she was, you know, always working. So I was like one in the streets while she was working. And like I said, them blue doors, it's, it's, it's to the point, it, it reminds me every time, a blue door, that the properties that I got now, all my doors is red. So that means something. So if you look at all my properties, they all the doors is all red. It's like a symbol of, it just, it just don't, it's just not right. You know, and you only know because you're in a box. So if you don't go outside the box, you will never know how you're supposed to live. And when I went to prison and came home, I changed my crowd. I was around people that had way more than what I had. And from there, I just kept going and kept going and kept going. And then that's why it sparked me to, to, to keep being an investor and look out for our community and get people back into the community to become homeowners because people are falling down. Sounds like, to me, each of you kind of share a story that your upbringing is actually what sparked that interest in you. And that's what made you want to purchase a home. And so that kind of leads into when did that happen for you? Because, and when I say when, was it a particular chapter in your life? Was it what age? How old were you? And I say that to say, because like I mentioned before, I am not a homeowner, I am a renter. I've been renting for five to six years. Um, and one of the things that I can be transparent about is that when it comes to homeownership, for some reason I have this notion that I'm too young. And I know, I know that sounds kind of crazy, but this is just, I'm giving um, answers and transparency and background that maybe some people who signed up for this workshop were afraid to say. And so for myself, one of the things that always backed me out of it was my age. Because I'm like, am I gonna be committed to this one spot for the rest of my life? Like I'm only 28 years old. So how old were each of you? And tell me how long was that preparation process before you actually purchased your own home? Did you catch yourself um, you know, budgeting and saving for X amount of years? How long did it take you before you purchased your first property? So I just want to know, what was that process like for each of you? How old were you? How long did it take you to buy your home? So, if anybody want to go first? Um, the very first time I tried to purchase a home, I was 19. And um, it was because, just transparent, I was pregnant with my first daughter and I was still living at home with my mom. And I was trying to get an apartment, but they want you to make three times the rent and things like that. When you try to get a mortgage, they don't have those types of strenuous income requirements, and it's a little bit lower, and, it's, and your mortgage would be lower than your rent, too. So, and so I started looking into it. I've always known I wanted to be a homeowner just because my dad was. And he always said, oh, we couldn't have this big house on the hill if your mom's credit was better, so we had to buy this. So like, <laughs> you know, so those like little stories, you know, with the parents driving you around the old neighborhoods and telling you things. So it was instilled in me since I was a child. And then, um, you know, those circumstances happened when I was 19 and pregnant and desperate for a place to live. And eventually I did get put out and ended up in a shelter at 19, just a month after I had my daughter. And that was the pivotal moment for my life. Being in there for six months waiting for housing is like endless. It was never ending. 
So thankfully, you know, my mom and I got back on good terms and I moved back home, but my process to buy a house started then at 19. I was 30 by the time I bought it because you need the income, you need the credit, you need the work history, you need a lot of things. And with our environment and without a proper education, you're not gonna be paid that much. So working your way up the totem pole to try to get higher paying jobs and things. So fast forwarding, I was 30 years old making about $40,000 a year when I bought my first property. And a lot of people think you need like 50, 60, 70,000. No, you don't. I bought a multi-family the first time. And when you do that, they will allow 75% of the income that you would be making from that property to apply to your income while you're applying for that mortgage. So it's like a loophole. So you, you get the income without having the income. That's gonna get you across that, that finish line to buy that property. So I couldn't afford market rate rent. So my avenue was to get a multifamily property. So I bought uh, three houses in a bulk sale. It wasn't like three apartment buildings, but um, it was a unique thing. It was a God thing. I can't even explain it to you. But whether it was a triplex or a duplex or three houses side by side, it's one loan, one mortgage. And I used a renovation loan. As you can see, Trent needs a lot of work. There are renovation loans. So I started looking at stuff saving, seeing what I needed to have my credit to do, like the very minimal, started cleaning it up. I applied for mortgages multiple times throughout the year. And each time I'm like, why am I denied? And I knew I was going to be denied, but I needed to know where I stood. So I needed to know where I, what I need to work on. And so I worked on my credit and I cleaned it up myself, you know, but we do have credit repair companies if you're not that savvy with it. But I taught myself these things. And um, so when I bought my property at 30, I had tenants that paid my mortgage, so for the past five years, I've basically been living for free because my tenants paid my mortgage for me. So think about that when you think about owning a home because you may want to go down a multi-family avenue versus a single family if your income isn't up there yet while you're working on it. For me, um, my college friend and I, because um, he was renting out one of the rooms at the apartment, um, we decided to say, hey, we were dealing with a slumlord, they didn't want to renovate or do anything, um, so we said, hey, let's buy a property. Um, we sat down with a mortgage lender, and he said, hey, your credit is trash. Your income is trash, your credit is trash, you can't buy nothing. So I'm like, damn, how do I do that? So we ended up, I ended up partnering with my coworker because had good credit, um, she had the income, so we ended up buying a duplex, like Jockey said. So we bought a duplex, and then the rental income from the tenant was covering the, the, all the expenses and the mortgage itself. So I was able to save money for, I want to say, about six to 12 months. So what I ended up doing was clearing my credit, um, paying off all the debts that I owed, and then I would say it took me about a year to get myself financially ready to purchase. Um, for me, I was 24 years old when we bought our house. I did not know that was going to be our only house. <laughs> so um, when you mentioned you have to stay there forever, technically you don't. Um, you can uh, get what's called equity in your home as the value increases. Take the value out of that home either to buy something else and sell what you have or keep what you have as a rental. Um, so in our case, though, we are still in the house that we purchased. and. Um, I knew I wanted to have investment properties and I thought that the house that we in that we were in, I would do what my parents did, buy something else and use that as a rental. So instead of um, us buying another home, I ended up buying investment properties, um, owning a multifamily, owning um, residential units, and owning a commercial building. So, and then what I've also done is partnered with four other women. We're called black females investing in real estate. We pulled our money together to buy some additional properties as well. So we're still doing the investment piece and have a diversified portfolio, even if you are staying in the home that you're you know, currently living in and have a spouse who doesn't want to move. <laughs> I was uh, I was 28 when 
when I bought my first home, uh, I didn't know nothing about credit. Still probably know a little bit about it. So all my properties, I don't know nothing about mortgage. I never pulled a mortgage, but I'm learning. I'm learning as I go. So all my properties, I kind of always was taught, don't owe nobody. You know, just pay cash. Just don't owe nobody. So I kind of don't know where to... I'm learning from this mortgage thing, too, the credit. I'm learning as, as y'all talking. So I was 28 years old. I happened to be at the right place at the right time. Uh, a guy, father had passed away. He don't know nothing about property. They was about to take the property from him. And I just so happened to be listening, and I, I had some money put up from working. And the guy was just like, um, I'm about to lose my property. I don't know what to do. They about to take it. So I said, well, look, I paid a lien off. I think it was like 12000 I gave him 12000 and I put 15000 in his pocket. So here it is. They about to take it. And I was explaining it to him, like, look, you're going to get nothing. If they take it, you get nothing. You let me get it, and I pay it off, and I put 15000 in your pocket, and you sign it over to me. Then you, it's a win-win for the both of us. And he didn't know what to do. So that's how I got my first property. My second property, uh, I, I started being around it. So now as I'm getting into the property, I'm meeting people. I'm fixing it up myself. I'm trying to fix it up. Uh, I started. They started telling me about the Mercer County that they do every Wednesday at 2 o'clock foreclosure. I bought another property from there. So every Wednesday, every Wednesday at, Mer at the South Broad Street, um, the, what's that, probation? The at 2 o'clock? Foreclosure properties throughout Trenton, they be having some good deals. But now it's, it's probably a little crazy, but it's still, just try it. So I bought my second one from there, I think I, like probably like four months later. Then I just kept going on and on and on. So I was I was 28, yeah, I was 28 when I first got my first property. Thank you, thank you. That's very impressive. But that's actually going to lead me to start being a little more direct with the questions now. So... Um, this is going to give me an opportunity to kind of um, have you guys give us some tips and tricks, um, a little bit of insight, inspire us to make a next step. Um, and I want to start with John. Since you are a real estate agent, you we can't avoid you when we're trying to buy a home. So <laughs> most importantly, we want to hear from you. And um, one of the first things that I want to ask is, I'm a buyer. Um, I want your insight on what's one of the first few things that I need to have ready before I speak to you. These are like, I can't avoid this. Before I talk to you, John, and hit your phone, <laughs> what am I supposed to have before you even move forward in the process? Oh, your finances. You can't be saying that, oh man, I want a half a million dollar property working at Starbucks. How to manage expectations. So you have to understand where you are financially. You gotta understand where you are with your credit. You gotta know what your debt to income ratio is, meaning that what is reporting on your credit? What monthly expenses am I paying? Because you may say, hey, you may be qualified for a $300,000 property, but what if you can't pay that mortgage for 30 years? Um, so understanding where you are financially is the most important part before you sit down with a realtor. Now, this market, it is extremely tough. Um, if you're picky and you want the perfect house, oh, it could be years before you find something. I'm not even going to lie. Um, so you, that's why I say you have to manage your expectations because you might not get everything that you want. So if realistically, if you really say, hey, you know, I don't mind sacrificing certain amenities to get the house that I want, especially because we're in a seller's market, um, it could take anywhere between 30, 60, to 90 days, but there's so many different factors, so it's not a real clear-cut answer to that. So if I have to give an estimate, about 30 to 60 days, and if you're doing down payment assistance, it could be a little bit longer.
makes you different from anybody else that I can see on the side. So tell us a little bit about that. Like, are there good ones? Are there bad ones? Who should we look for? So there are good ones, and unfortunately, um, a good realtor is going to serve their client, put their client's needs first, meaning that if they go at a property and let's say the realtor might make a lesser commission if they show that property, they're gonna show that property to a cli to their client regardless. But the bad realtor is like, oh, I'm not showing that because I know I'm not making money on that, so I'm gonna show something else. So, and the qualities that you should look for in a realtor is somebody that listens to your needs. So if you say you want a two bedroom, two bedroom, one bath um, house and they should show you condos, they say, hey, I feel like you should get a condo I don't think that's a realtor that you should work with because they're just serving themselves, not serving you. So, if that answers your question. It does. It sounds like you really have to make sure you can kind of build a little bit of a relationship. Correct. Or it doesn't, you don't have to be best friends, but at least someone that understands your circumstances, situation, where you're trying to go, so they can just see your vision. Yeah, basically they gotta see what, where you wanna be and help you get to where you wanna be, not help them where they wanna be. Because again, we are, we make money when you sell, but we work for you, period. We You don't work for us, we work for you, so we wanna serve you. And if you feel like they're not serving your best interest, I wouldn't work with them. Oh, thank you, thank you. Let's give them a round of applause, thank you. That is beautiful information, thanks so much. Um, I actually wanna talk to Frida now, so. Um, the difference between you and John is you are a real estate broker. He is a real estate agent. So I kind of want to understand, I want you to kind of build that fine line between us and let us know what is the difference between someone like John and someone like yourself, me as a home buyer, who do I approach for what? So just help us understand that a little better. So, um... A real estate broker is a credential that is uh, earned through classes that allows for that person to have extended education and knowledge about the real estate market um, and about the real estate industry. We also have opportunities to serve in managerial roles, open up our offices, be instructors, so that it just opens up a different world of what you're able to do if you're looking to advance yourself in the real estate industry. Um, I still operate as a realtor. I work with the public. I do buyer consultations. I do listing consultations. So it's important to, um, when you're you know looking for someone, to be able to um, make sure you're being consulted properly, that they're asking you the right questions and you're able to ask them the right questions. Um, as a broker, one of the things that I do when I'm managing my office, uh, we have 17 agents in, in my office, um, is helping them put these strategies together so that they can continue to work with the public. Um, it's you know dealing with all of the legal aspects that come along with owning a business, managing people, uh, managing your clients, all of that. So it, it's, it's, a different, um, it's a different aspect. Um, one of the other things I do want to point out, too, is that you can work with a realtor and you can work with a real estate agent. Um, a realtor is a designation that many of us have, um, have also earned where we are bound by the code of ethics. So, whereas a real estate agent is not bound by that. So, when you're looking for um, someone to work with, I encourage you guys to look with realtors who, um, again, these code of ethics bound us to the consumer, to our colleagues and to uh, the public. So it's very, very important to know that we are bound by, by a code of how we're supposed to work when we're, uh, with, when we're working with people, so. All right, so um, I'm gonna segue into another question or two that is gonna be actually between Brittany and Jossie. Um, just for the sake of time, of course, I don't want to keep everybody too long from going to the breakout sessions. So I'm going to try to make sure that this is something that is effective, of course. So Jossie as a financial advisor and Britt as an investor, um, I kind of want to understand, like, as a financial advisor, um, what exactly do you do? 
um, especially in the home buying process. Um, just tell us a little bit about that. And then I want to understand Brit as an investor when you're seeing a property and if something is, can you look at something and tell it's a loss or what can you see as worth as an investment? So I'm going to start with Jossie first to kind of open us up into financial advisement and what we should look for. Uh, so over the past few years, I've been basically teaching people doing one-on-one -on -one consultations and group consultations uh, to help improve your financial situation. So fiscal responsibility is number one when, you, when it comes to home ownership. Knowing what you can afford and when you start applying for your mortgage, you will learn what you can afford based on what your debts are, what your incomes are. So uh, I start from the ground up just basically being responsible, cutting out bad spending habits, repairing your credit and things like that. So it's not just making enough money, but being careful how you spend your money. And if you're going to spend your money, put it in the right places, like stocks, like high interest rate savings accounts. You don't want a savings, a savings account that's going to pay you 0 0.0001, right? We see that a lot. Uh, I would suggest you open up a, a high interest a savings account with American Express or Capital One, they have 4.99% and they pay monthly dividends, not quarterly. So every single month at the end of the month, they're going to calculate how much you have in that savings and then at the first or between the first and the third of the next month, you'll see your return and your investment because when you put the money in the bank, they're using your money to make their investments, right? So you want to make sure you get a return on the investments they're making with your money. So you may make $36 a month off a $10,000 savings account. So start to look for high interest rate savings accounts. You want something that's at least 4%. That's a good um, rate, not 0 0.0001. You, it'll take a long time to save. So you want to start looking at strategic methods like that to make more money while you're making money. So um, budgeting is another thing. Writing down, use those budget books, write down every expense that you have, comb through your bank accounts and look at every expense, everything that you spend money on. Shopping, food, gas, car insurance, rent, clothes, hair, nails, haircuts, movies, whatever it is, vacations. Take account for everything that you spend your money on, on a daily and monthly basis. And then start to say, I don't really need all of these different subscriptions. <laughs> I don't really need cable. I can use Wi-Fi and I can get a Netflix account and an HBO Max and I'm good. You know, I, don't, I can cut out $50 there or I can start doing my own hair and cut out another however much you spend on your hair or your own nails and you can cut that out. Like, it takes building positive habits that's going to save you money and earn you money at the same time. So, uh, because once you get into home ownership, it's not like being a renter. You're responsible for everything. And that, it sounds scary, but it's really not because you can move on your own time. And you may know somebody that can fix it up versus waiting on your landlord. That could take months long for them to come fix your toilet. And you could call somebody over the weekend or something like that, you know, a family member or a local contractor that you may know, your neighbor. So there are ways to cut down on expenses and work on your own time and your own money as a homeowner. But first of all, you have to be fiscally responsible. So, you know, cut out the cigarettes, cut out the smoking, the drinking, the partying. Some of these things take sacrifice to get to where you want to be. And then after you get into your home, then you can start to say, okay, I got a little bit of money left over every month. I can start to, you know, have a little fun every now and again. Now I can take a vacation maybe once a year. Like, you got to see where you are, but the priority is to have a roof over your head. So fiscal responsibility, that's what I think. Um, as an investor, right, it's tricky because you gotta have a lot of patience, number one. You gotta have a lot of patience. Uh, you gotta know what you, huh? Yeah, well you gotta have patience for sure because in this field, um, I stay in my lane, I'm just an investor. So I'm not gonna go in there acting like I got all the sense. And then when you hire people, stay away from people that say they know how to do everything. That's kind of 
the worst. Like, you just no, tell me what you're good at. I just want to know, if you're a roofer, just stick to roofing. Don't tell me you know how to do floors, you know how to do a bathroom. I don't want that. So I stay away from people that tell me they know how to do everything. That's a red flag. Just stick to what they know how to do. If you good, like 750 agencies, they good at credit. So go over there and get your credit right. Don't go ask them about no, can you fix my roof for me? That's not their lane. You know what I'm saying? That's not their lane. So, you know, you just got to be in, also be into it. Like if you're an investor, hang around investors. You know, don't go hang around people that's partying and asking them, can you help me put my toilet together? They don't know nothing about a toilet. They 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 they, they like to the party, you get what I'm saying? So you really gotta stick around people that know what they're talking about, people that got experience. So when you're looking for a property, do your research as well. Pull an Oprah out. A o o what's my Oprah? Oh yeah, Oprah requests on your properties so you can know how old is it. Uh who when was the last person bought it? The the foundation of it, you know, um take somebody with you so that know what they doing, not everything, but take because it's really like, doing property is really like the same thing. You start from the roof to the bottom, work your way down. So you get a roofer, you get a plumber, you get an electrician, that don't change. You always need that same method. It's just, you gotta find the good people that's gonna do it. And it, the world that we live in today, like I said, everybody know how to do everything. So you know, you got people working at Walmart and tell you they can fix your roof. <laughs> and, and that's the kind of people you kind of want to stay away from. So when you're looking into investing on a property, say, like, I can't tell y'all nothing about owning a home. I don't own a home. So I'm not going to sit here and say, yeah, well, you got to be qualified for a 750 credit score. I don't know. But when it comes to investing about properties, I think I have like eight properties now. I have more, but I got rid of a lot of them. And I can tell you all about it because that's my field. That's what I know how to do. So always stick to stay in your lane and stick to what you know and be around it. So as you be around it, the universe will kind of bring information to you. So stay to... Whatever you want to do in life, period, whether it's investing or you want to be the best mechanic, stick around people that are mechanics. You're only going to get better that way if you stick to the strip. Stick to whatever you want to do in life. Don't go asking people that don't have a clue or don't know nothing about what you want to do in life. So stick to what you know. because a lot of people, I got got one time, let me tell you this story. So I bought this property in Hermitage from a family member. And um, I didn't know that the, the lien, he had a, they had a lien on it for 36000 I bought the property for 50000 So I was responsible for the lien, I didn't know that. It came with the with the property. So when I happened to go try to sell it, they like, uh, yeah, well, they took 36000 from me. Like, why? Why y'all took 36000 from me? Because it was a lien on this property. So it sticks to the property. Don't go with you or the person. It stays to that property. So make sure when you buy a property, make sure there ain't no liens on there. You can get a lien from the water company. Somebody could buy your water bill. That's a lien, and they could take your property from your water bill. Tax, your tax lien is real pay. The property tax is from the city. They could take it. Somebody could buy it. So be careful on uh, when you trying to invest and buy a property. Do your research. That's like a must. Get a title agency. Get a lawyer. Like you have to get this because if not, you're gonna be you're gonna find yourself running in circles. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, that was really valuable insight. Um, that I really actually did not know that about the liens. I did not know. I thought they followed you the rest of your life, so they follow the property. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I really hope that each person that did listen today um, gained some type of insight from each of you because you guys are important pillars in the real estate world. Um, and so I hope that that sparked some type of interest in someone in this room. Um, and then that will lead us to our breakout session. So I hope that each of you each grabbed the schedule from the check-in table that would um, pretty much point you to your next destination. Uh, we want you to, one, enjoy some of the breakfast. We are going to have lunch, but please take some of the breakfast in the back. Um, these breakout sessions will be an opportunity for you to really kind of have more of a personal conversation. This was just an opener to um, walk you into what you just will see pretty much in the real estate world. But
important financial decision in your mind? Because you don't want to go into it not knowing and afraid to ask that question or not giving you an answer. So here's some red, uh, website uh, resources when you start with what it's called Profit. Um, profit Rail says the way we perceive the MLS that we have the most accurate um, resource that we use at our disposal. But if you want to look at some other places, we have realtor.com below as well. So here are some things what the offer should look like. So uh, your agent will be writing up the offer, but it's, it's going to have your first and last name, what the purchase price is, your inspection period, the title company that you're going to use to close, any contingencies that you want in the contract, how many days you're looking to close, and how much earned money will you need to close the job. Jersey, they use title companies to close. North Jersey, they use attorneys to close. So 
so it can't be. But if you if you want to, if you want to hire an attorney, it's basically equivalent to the contract with Shore. And it is a standard contract, so the attorneys come in. They're the only ones who can see it. As the realtor, we can add to lines that are on there. But if there was verbiage that needed to be stronger to protect either the buyer or the seller, the attorney would do that for the attorney. But that's a separate fee outside of the DOT. Yes. Yes. But we'll be talking about the fee also. So the attorney is inferior in any of those texts. So now, the lender. So the duties of a lender is basically to make sure documents are, to receive all your documents, to make sure that your documents are ready for you to go to underwriting. That's it. Now, your home inspector. Now, in every, most contracts you have an inspection period, like we talked about before. So your home inspection period is basically the set amount of time to do your due diligence on the property, to make sure that you look at what repairs you need, if there's leaking and coming up. During that time, you can renegotiate with the seller. So let's say you go on a contract and there's a repair that is like $20,000. And you say, hey, I'm not going to fix this. And he says, no, that's the only time we need to back out of the contract and get your money back. Well, that's one of the times you need to back out of the contract and get your money back. So that's your inspection period. So getting through your inspection period. So your inspection period usually starts after the attorney review. It usually takes between 10 to 14 business days, depending on what you added to the contract. If the inspection period doesn't have issues, you get the test page to renegotiate with the seller. The inspection period is the only time where you're able to back out of the contract without losing your earnings. And you aren't required to get an inspector for an inspection period, but I highly recommend anybody, everybody to get an inspector. If you are walking through a house and it is
plumbing work, electrical work, stuff like that. If you um, budget for certain monthly bills that you might be dealing with, like let's say you buy it for cash, you gotta pay for your property taxes, you gotta pay for your homeowners insurance, you gotta pay if you're in a um, association, a HOA, like a condo or a townhouse. So that's something that you have to make sure that you have money put aside. If you're paying a mortgage, then you tend to pay your property taxes and your insurance comes out of that, you have to make sure you have money set aside. And then you have to make sure you have a good licensed contractor on call. Like, let's say your water's faulted and you don't have no contractor, and then you gotta deal with that. It, it, it pays to have somebody on call that can come in, hey, I need something done. So make sure you have a good contractor or handyman available that can come out and make sure if, uh, you can tackle any repairs. And one rule that we forgot to put on here is it's okay to enroll in the university every night. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. so yeah. Yeah. like yeah. learning, we had our first, we didn't know how to like the pilot. And we first yeah. paid oh, somebody yeah. $300. Yeah. And then when I thought yeah. we did, I was like, next time, we're yeah. going to,
How was that experience for you? Uh, I brought three lines. One I got out of that God
throughout the course of the entire time. So you pay $1,000 here per month, and then you make the same for 30 years. Okay. Okay. So I, I want to make sure that you understand one other really, really important part to a mortgage that a lot of people don't understand. So the mortgage itself is called the principal and the interest. There's a portion of the mortgage that's called the escrows. And what the escrows are is the insurance and the taxes. What remains the same throughout the life of the loan for is the payment for just that. So if your taxes go up in your account, your homeowner's insurance go up, goes up, sorry, how long do you have to, your mortgage payment's going to go up too. So if you ever got a bill and it's higher, because they'll send you a letter and say, hey, your, your taxes have gone up, we're going to have to continue to pay it up front, it's different, it's different mortgage payments. So it recalculates your mortgage payments and they increase your mortgage payments over time. So I, I want you to understand that, even though it does not say it up here, because your mortgage payments will stay the same except for the escrows that will change for all of mortgage for 30 years?
Um, conventional mortgages are not government banks. They are private, a lot of people think they are, they're not. They are um, privately owned and traded on the stock market through banking and credit. So Fannie and Freddie, what they do is they set the industry standards for um, what they're going to lend on, how they're going to lend. not looking for somebody that has crooked sidewalks or electrical wires hanging from the ceiling, peeling paint. So the houses need to be in good working order. So that's the difference between the two. And then this one, this well, all three of them have a uh, component where they're actually giving you a rehab loan to.
one is 10 years. These are five. So how does that work? So every year it drops off a portion of it. So um, it would drop down 20% of the amount that you owe. So you say, okay, well, I got this house now. I got this job down in Florida. And I know I just got this out three years. I still got this lease outside of my local mortgage that I got to pay back. Well, how much is that I got to pay back? You have to pay back 20% of whatever you borrowed.
it's your one year anniversary, now you have all the money in the account for it to be paid. So is that when I hear people saying they own four bedrooms and they have four own properties for a while? Some people their um, homeowners insurance is included and some people do it without it. What is that? So um, you would have to put down more than 20% or they call it, we would call it a mortgage plan, waiting with escrows. Mm -hmm. You would have to put down more than 20% to do, take that responsibility on yourself. You would not be open to bringing up the interest. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it would be out off, off the table. Because, you know, table. most people are like, oh, I don't want them to touch it. Like, I'll just do it myself. You know, only because they think that that's. That's the quickest way to lose your house. Mm -hmm. <laughs>
purchase. And I wrote on the board just the, some of the most important things that as a lender that I'm going to be looking for and looking at. And that is your income, your debt, your credit, and your savings. And these are the four most important things that we evaluate in order to qualify you for a loan. So when I'm talking about income, I'm talking about all of your income sources, whether it's rental income, whether it's alimony, your employment, your part-time job, all those things, um, wherever you're generating income from, you want to make sure that that stuff is documented. So when you complete an application, you fill out all this information and you tell them, you know, my income, this is where I work, and uh, this is how much I make. But you also have to show documentation. So the key documents that we need to justify and to verify income, they, the lender did their research and found that he ended his employment on December 6th. His contract ended with his team, and he went with another team. That's a breach of contract. So that's so they had grounds to foreclose on his home. So this documentation is so important because they want to make sure that you're currently employed, where you said you were employed, as well as going to be receiving this income in, into the future, so that you can make this mortgage payment. What about if you own your own business? Self-employed, totally different ballgame, right? So self-employed, they're going to need. Um, they want to see your 1099s. They want to see your tax returns for two years. But there's another one that they can use, which is even better than the tax returns, because business owners, y'all should know this, you like to write off all your stuff to reduce that taxable income. So you might have made 200000 but you only show them that you made 30000 because you wrote everything off. As a lender, and you show me your tax return on the 30000 I can't qualify you for anything. There's something else called a bank statement loan. Statement. So a bank statement loan, and I don't know if- um, That's a specific product, or is that just what you can use to get another product? It's, the, it's what you can use to get the loan. Gotcha. Yep. So the bank statement loan, or the bank statement income verification, is we're gonna look at two years of your bank statements, 12, 12 months to two years, look at the deposits from the business and take an average of those deposits, that's gonna give us your income number, which is gonna be way higher than what that tax return is gonna show you. So I had a client recently, they, um, they were looking to, to buy a new construction and because they had so many write-offs, their income wasn't enough to purchase their home, so whoever their advice, advisor was told them, hey, next year don't do that many write-offs, um, they ended up with a tax bill. They had to pay $80,000 in the tax bill. So now they don't have the money for a down payment. Now if the advisor would have known about the bank statement loan, we could have justified the loan. So it just put them in the catch 22. But we can do, we can verify income for self-employed individuals with a bank statement loan or bank statement income verification. So, New business, you gotta have at least two years. So the business has to be in business for at least two years. So it's gonna be a combination of the two. So it's gonna be the tax returns and the bank statements. And banks don't usually do this. Lenders typically do this, outside lenders. If a business like has a really good stretch of six months or a year, that's still not enough validity. Just six months? I'm just saying hypothetically, let's say someone says, well, my business just started doing really well in the past six months to a year. Do you think that that's not enough insurance for? They take the average. They take the average. Okay. Yeah, they're going to take the average. So we want to see two years of signed tax returns just to make sure that it is actually a business, right? So that's what we're going to use that for. But we'll use the bank statement to determine how much income that business is generating. I think my question was more like, what about when new businesses try to move into like their own states? Like you started a business, say you had a restaurant or something, and automatically you would need a space to obviously have that restaurant, but there's no income if you just started it. So would it go off the owners? Yes, it would have to go off the owner. If the business, if we can't find a history of the business making money, then it would have to be on the owner. One last one. Mm -hmm. One question. Uh, bank statements. What if, like, you've changed banks? Mm -hmm. Do you still just provide statements for each month for yep. different banks? It doesn't, like, matter or anything like that. As long as it's, we have month by month 
the statement is. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So important an important piece of this in preparation is making, especially for uh, self-employed and business owners, you want to have that bank, bank account for the business owner. You don't want to commingle your business and your personal bank accounts. Because this, this bank account should show all of the income, all of your income that's coming in for this business should go into this account. Gotcha. I don't care how many accounts you have, make sure all of your income goes into one account. Because when we use this bank statement loan, we'll look at the income and then we can take the average on that. Yeah, so make sure that income's going into one account. And, and they, they are meticulous. Some of these underwriters are meticulous. They're going to be looking at where the money's going out to. You got a bunch of cash apps on there. Why are you paying these people? They ask those types of questions. Um, you just why is what is this twenty five hundred dollar transaction? Who was that? They get real specific on some of those things. Some